factory. And then we uh, continued to talk about building and running composable microservices in the cloud. And now it's, I think it's time to dig a little bit deeper, right, in, into the actual execution of code. Welcome. All right. Um, so it's the illusion of execution. We're going to look into the differences in our mental model and what actually happens on the hardware inside the JVM. Um, I like to start my talks because some people might leave. Um, thank you very much for coming. If you leave in the middle, I'm not mad or anything. And thanks to the organizer who brought me here and all that good stuff. Um, I'm Nitsan Vakat. I work for Azul Systems. We make that uh, the Zing JVM, uh, which is that exciting little fellow uh, over there. And I have a blog. Um, I don't know if anybody reads it. Does anybody in the audience read my blog? Well done. Clever people. Good decisions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which the, the blog is mostly about quirky things I find in the JVM and lock free queues and all that. Um, and we're going to dig right in. The JVM is a magical place. Uh, it is a magical place. It's, you know, we write our code, you write in any JVM language, you compile, you pack, deploy, there's a variety of tools for that. And this is, these are the parts that most developers understand because they do that every day, all day. And then, you know, some magic happens and the JVM executes the code and you're, you find yourself riding Darth Vader, much like Freddie Mercury in this picture. Um, so let's, let's have a closer look at the way down. Um, you write your byte code, it's packed, it's deployed, it's all good, right? It's executed, and executed is a complicated word uh, because there's different modes of execution. There's the interpreter, the C1 code, and then the C2 code. Uh, but that's not enough because the JVM has to actually put that code somewhere, make sure that uh, the OS picks it up because the JVM is a process inside the OS. It's not all by itself. And then the OS has to speak to some particular hardware and that's where you know the rubber meets the road. This is where your, your code actually gets to run. Um, I'd like to start with a favorite quote from a favorite 80s movie. Um, everybody hates assembly. Anybody here likes assembly? And just ended up here because of some weird career choice. Right. Um, we're going to have to look at some assembly. Uh, don't be afraid. It's, this is all the assembly you're going to need to talk, or particularly all, all you need to, talk, to know about assembly for this talk. So every line of assembly we're going to look at is a single instruction. And every instruction takes one, two, however many cycles of the CPU working through it. We're going to look a lot at move, because move is what object-oriented programs like to do. Uh, and we look, we, we might sort of glimpse an if here and there, and this is what ifs end up being. There's a comparison and then there's a jump. We jump to the positive or the negative of that condition according to which jump we use. And then there's increment and we'll sort of glimpse an increment in here. That's it. That's all the assembly we're going to see. Don't panic. Um, right. So code to assembly, you run your code, it heats up. We're only going to look at C2 code because going through the assembly, the interpreter and the C1 and C2, all that it would fill hours of fun and joy for all of us, um, but wouldn't fit in this talk, and we want to talk about some other things. So we, we look at this holder class, and all it does is you give it a reference. If it's already holding the reference, then it returns false. And if it's not the same thing, it'll hold that new piece of love and increment a counter. Um, and then we will glimpse the assembly, just, just a little bit. There's just, you know, a little bit more. And then this, this is it, right? It's not that much. This is why people don't like assembly and, you know, somehow, you know, how we, we end up not reading the assembly because it's very unpleasant. Right. So you, you need to drill down, you need to drill down to the important bits in all that assembly. For instance, this is the, the method header, or the prologue to the method. And the only really important bits we need to know about are those two highlighted lines. We need to know which register is this, which register is the parameter. The rest of it we can sort of safely ignore for the sake of focusing on our code. 
And this is what happens, this is the normal running code, this is the hot path of our program, or at least the way I ran it, and it's a lot less code than the terrifying three pages of really small writing. Um, we're, still, we're not going to go line for line here, um, but we're going to look at some interesting things that just happened with this compiled code. For instance, um, this code has some other classes code. So I used this method in the context of an integer, so the, hold, the held object was an integer. And so because I was using equals, the C2 compiler decided to inline integer equals into my method, which is a, a great thing because the code works that much faster, uh, but it's done conditionally. So if I suddenly change my mind and throw more objects into the mix, this code is going to have to be decompiled, so de-optimized and recompiled, and the new compilation would take care of uh, non-monomorphic sort of occasion. And it's interesting because this is a, a big difference to how we used to think about compilation in the C world and the assembly world, where you build your binary, and that's the binary you get, and that's it. It's not going to change at runtime. It's not going to match the circumstances it's in. And the JIT compiler does these awesome things with some side effects. We'll get to the side effects later. Also, uh, compiler reordering. This is important to anyone doing concurrency-related stuff. It's not theoretical. This is a very simple piece of code, and yet already you see reordering in action. Uh, the increment line has moved up. The move has moved down to the store of the reference into the uh, holder field has moved down. If we were somehow relying on the counter in some other part, in some other thread, this would sort of potentially be a bug for our program. So the takeaway here is that this can happen to you, this can happen to your code, and if you're writing concurrent code, you have to be always aware of, you know, the order you write the program is not necessarily the order it gets executed. Uh, not, <laughs> we won't even go into the fact that the CPU can also reorder instructions. Uh, so, just don't count on it. You have to put in concurrency guards and make sure this correct happen before relationships and all that, but we won't go into that because that's the whole JMM two and a half hour talk by uh, Shipulev you can find somewhere and watch. Right, instructions you have. So you got some code and you want it to run. You got to get some cycles. You got to get onto the CPU. You got to get some power under that code. How, how do you do that? So let's, let's start thinking about threads here. If I run, let's assume there's a process and it's a Java process with that ID. And I run JSTAC and I look at the great output there. How many threads are running at any given time, any program? Who thinks there's more than one? Who thinks there's zero threads running? Good. Um, the problem with JSTAC and the way the thread states are, are reported, this is just a, a place for me to rant, really, uh, is that it describes threads as runnable. Nothing is running. Uh, the reason for that is that the stack is taken at a safe point. None of your threads are allowed to run so that we can sample the stack. Um, it's, it's a really idiotic uh, description of thread states. So let's not use that. Let's uh, talk a bit about multitasking OSs and how they deal with threads, because Java threads are real OS threads. So there's a direct sort of plug into the OS there. So multitasking OS allow you to have more processes than cores. Let's start with that. That is a great thing. Um, we can have all the threads we want, nearly, until we run out of memory and so on. But we can have lots of threads. Seriously, if you try and max out the number of threads you can have, it's, it's, uh, you're going to have quite a lot of threads. But um, that's all great until they all try to run at the same time. So it's, it's like musical chairs. There's only so many cores, and you have to sit on the core to actually get any time. Um, so a lot of swapping is, is going on. But this happens, obviously, because they can't all be on top of the cores. So going back to the JSTAC, it would tell you roughly you know, 10 to however many uh, threads are runnable, uh, none of them are actually running. If all the runnable threads are, were running, you would be in this imaginary world where more threads 
then you have cores can actually be running at any given time. So that can't happen. Uh, we have to have some scheduling, we have to have some interrupts, so if someone's sitting in the chair, we have to be able to get them up, get them out, and try and swap them out. Um, and that leads to fairness, because um, any, any situation where you have limited resources leads to discussions about ethics and, you know, who's allowed to sit in the chair, whose turn is it. Uh, so the OSs usually try to be fair, don't starve different threads and so on. Uh, you have thread priority you can play with. And then you have to worry about context switching as an overhead. Uh, context switching is a bit of a fuzzy overhead because not only do you have to execute some code to get the other thread in, uh, you also have to pull in all of its context. So if we move on with the uh, sort of sitting at a desk metaphor, you have to sit at the desk, bring all your stuff, arrange your laptop and your coffee and everything, and only then can you start working. So all this shuffling about is you know, not without cost. This is the real thread states, sort of, or the important thread states we have in Linux. We have waiting, so you're at the red light, you're actually stopped. You have ready, so you want to run, and then you have actually running. Only, you know, the number of cores, the, the number of cores limits the amount of running threads. You can't have more running threads than cores, I'll repeat. And this is a violation of the sort of Jedi principle where there's only do and do not. This is ready as try. I want to run. I really want to run, but I'm not running. Um, so, moving on from that, have you ever written a single threaded Java application. Who's written a single threaded Java application? Like a little test, main, program, right? No one, because, um, well, not no one. I had someone walk up to me and say, well, I wrote Java on an embedded chip and it really had the number of threads that, you know, yes, okay. Except for that, normal people, most people run in the JVM and the JVM has lots of threads and it has lots of threads because it does lots of stuff for us and it doesn't necessarily happen in our thread. Uh, so it has uh, you know, your application threads, your native threads. So if you're using any native libraries, they would typically have some, some threads allocated to them. Or well, not typically, depends on the library you use. Um, and then you have the JVM threads, and you have um, no such thing as a single threaded application because all of these things are in the background. They're not necessarily running. Right? We're not having a fight here. Uh, the GC will wake up every once in a while and clear the decks. The compiler will co kick off and compile a bit of code. But it's not constantly running. There's no contention issue here. But also there's, there's an inherent concurrency to Java that uh, we need to be aware of uh, if, if we worry about latency in particular. But also it's just healthy to know that there's other people in the JVM. Um, so there's an example of an application running on my laptop. Um, you get four GC threads, just because that's the default ergonomics. You get three compiler threads. You get other threads. You get 15 threads reported by JSTAC. You get 19 threads if you ask the OS. There's a, there's a big group of threads playing around there. Uh, the number of threads changes according to what you tell the JVM to do. So what are the takeaways here? Um, you should try and avoid having more ready threads than, than cores. It happens, inevitably it happens. You know, you don't you know, allocate enough threads or more than enough threads to your uh, thread pools and they all collide and it's a bit of a mess. But if you systematically uh, do that, you get a long run queue. And when you have a long run queue, that means there's a lot of people, they want to grab the CPU. They will grab the CPU, they'll just contend, they'll, they'll get in each other's way and everything will take longer instead of less time. Uh, context switches are a cost to worry about in that case. Um, this is something you see mostly in low latency applications. People who actively constrain the, uh, the OS environment and the application to the hardware. And I don't know why only the low latency guys do it. On a, on a large scale, I think, if you paid a lot of money for a piece of hardware, 
it's not some you know, random tea party that we're talking about, right? This is a professional environment. You don't want some guy to come in, grep a log, and suddenly the web server that you actually paid a lot of money to have running and serve people would go to its knees because someone's fucking around with log files, right? You want to have separation, so you can have separation. It's not hard to have separation. Um, where things get trickier is if you want to pin a particular thread to a particular core and then you, you have a very limited sort of pipeline and you need to really know what you're doing. Uh, but on a large scale, I'm surprised not more people limit the OS and all users to a couple of cores and just take the rest for their application and have no one mess around with it. It's not that hard to do. Uh, and it, would, it reduces the headache uh, involved in, you know, oh, why did my application stop for so long? Um, Something to note, if you do that, the JVM doesn't know you've done that. So it looks at the whole machine, it assumes it has the whole machine to work with, and you can tweak the number of threads, you can inform the JVM on, on your decisions. Uh, so you can control the thread counts, you can control the GC thread counts. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't remember if you can control the compiler thread counts, but I think you can. Um, and, you know, if if... It's something you worry about. It's definitely something you should consider doing. Right, memory illusions. Um, moving right along. How long does it take to invoke a getter? You see a lot of benchmarks out there, and people try and get blah, and it comes back and say, oh, I spent a lot of time in the getter. Um, how long does it take to actually get a bit of memory back into your CPU? And when we want to get something, we use the move instruction. I mentioned the move instruction initially, and we're coming back to it. What you'll notice from this slide is that it happens a lot. We do a lot of moves, right? We got moves. Uh, there's two kinds of moves, right? There's this one, punch to the face, no. There's the uh, register move, so we move from one register to the next. That is sort of predictable, right? Because we're in the CPU, we know where everything is. It takes one cycle. Not only does it take one cycle, it's like it's got great throughput properties. I can do four other things while I do that, right? Then we have the red moves. And the red moves, I don't know how much they cost because there's really no way to know what they cost. Um, and I'd like to highlight that because this is, you know, in a normal uh, talk on memory hierarchy. This is the memory topology, right? You have the CPU, it has a register. One cycle, I grab that register. It's not in the register. I'm going to go to the L1 or L2. It's going to take a few more cycles. I'm going to go to the last level cache and grab because it's not in my uh, local cache. And then I'm going to go to main memory. And memory is the new disk. And that's a tragedy. And then I'm going to hit the actual hard drive. But I paid money and it's an SSD. So it's going to be a few tens of thousands of uh, cycles, or I was a cheapskate and I got the hard drive and it's going to be millions of cycles. I'm just going to sit there and cry. Why do I mention uh, the hard drives in the context of the uh, memory sort of move, right? Get to that in a second. Right, this is another illustration of, of uh, you know, reinforcing the fact that memory takes uh, a long time to get, depending on where it is, and it's a very nice sort of beer cache hierarchy. You know, it's I'm gonna sip it, and it's on the table, it's on the bar, it's at the store, it's on the moon. It's all very exciting, right? <laughs> um, you're gonna go to the moon and grab this cold beer from out of space. The funny thing is, you know, people look at that. I say, okay, I'm just not going to go to disk. This is that, it's that simple. Why don't I just grab everything out of the L1 cache? That would solve the problem. Wouldn't that be great? Right? The problem is, there's two problems. A, L1 cache is really small and not everything fits in there. But more than that, um, you just have no way of knowing. There's no special move instruction that says, get it from L1. And if it's not in L1, I just don't want to know, right? This, I'm only taking stuff from L1 because I'm in a hurry, and this is what I do. I just take stuff from L1. And if it's not there, forget about it. No, you reach for your beer, and then you freeze. And until you get back from the moon, you are not moving. This is it. You know, you reach for your beer, you're like, I don't know, there must be some Star Trek hologram standing there, 
until you get back from the moon with your cold beer and continue drinking, and you won't know that it happened. You're like, oh, where'd everybody go? It's, you know, they got long beards and all that. Uh, we've been looking for you. You stood there like an idiot for a month. Um, right. So. Why am I talking about uh, hard drives? It's, aren't we talking about memory? Let's see. How is it faster to get something from a hash map, or is it faster to grab a byte from a file on the hard drive? Right? Who thinks it's faster to get from a hash map? That's clever people. Yes, this is this is an expert here in the crowd who uh, realizes that the um, Answer to every performance problem you will ever see is it depends. <laughs> and the right answer here is it depends. Why does it depend? Because uh, memory is a funky thing. Right. The JVM doesn't have memory. It asks the OS for memory. And the memory uh, the OS gives it, it's virtual memory. It's not physical memory. And Virtual memory can be divided into sort of resident and so on. Uh, there's a lot of good reading to be done. The, the thing is, resident is not actually evil. Resident is good. Right? Uh, so how much memory can one process use? It can use more than you have. It can use more than the hard drive has, in theory, until it actually uses it. Right? Um, so it sort of lazily allocates pages for you. And when we exceed the physical memory, uh, what often happens is we go into swap because we didn't turn off swap. Why didn't we turn off swap? Uh, because, you know, in the good old days it was a good idea to have swap because uh, memory was very constrained. These days I ask you please to buy some more memory. Okay, if anybody, does anybody think memory is expensive? No, because it's not expensive, right? Turn Swap off, just stop doing that. Uh, and page faults happen. Page faults are a funny thing. Page faults happen uh, anyway, because you're going to read a page and it's going to fault the first time. What you don't want to see is repeated page faults. You don't want to see thrashing. You don't want to see you know, pages go back to disk and back again. And, you know, so this is you know, something to watch out for, because usually it's not a problem. You have the memory. You're just not uh, configuring the system correctly. And this is why it can take less time to read from a file, because when you read from a file, you don't read from a file. You read from the page cache in most OSs these days. Uh, so you go to the page cache, and if the page cache has it, you actually end up going to memory. Life is awesome, right? But if you read from memory, you go to your page table. And your page table may have been swapped to disk. So you end up going to disk. So the read from the hash map will end up going to disk, and you will cry. Uh, this is particularly bad for Java programs. There's a difference here. Java programs suffer more when uh, the process starts to page fault. This is because of GC, and this is because of save points as well. We'll get to the save points later. Who knows what a save point is? Right. OK. There'll be questions later. OK. Before we get to that, one thing that's really important about memory and disk is sequential access, good. Random access, bad. Okay. Uh, this is a slide from years ago. It's a pathological sort of benchmark. And what it shows, curiously enough, is that if you uh, treat your memory badly, if you don't treat your memory right, uh, it'll be worse than disk. It's a bit of an extreme case. But um, if you read sequentially from the hard drive, everything will get loaded up in front of you. The, you know, everybody's trying hard to get you the throughput you, they want to show off great throughput. And they can do because your access is really, really predictable. And the same goes for memory. If you access memory sequentially, the CPU understands what you're doing. And it'll start prefetching everything. And life will be awesome. You will get throughput that you don't actually know what to do with. But uh, if you don't do that, if you start sort of jumping around and look for references everywhere and use a linked list, God forbid, um, then you will end up spending a lot of time waiting for stuff to appear because the CPU can't do that. Right. Takeaways here. If you're benchmarking anything, use relevant data sizes because you need to think about exceeding your cache and use relevant uh, data access patterns. 
And this is something a lot of benchmarks miss. Um, when you allocate a collection that you're going to mess around with, uh, you allocate all the objects and you put them into the uh, array or whatever. And what you've just done is uh, given the JVM a, a leg up because uh, you've allocated everything you're going to look at sequentially. And so you have the array and you have all the objects li lined up sequentially and life is really great. Only real life is not like that. So. You know, if you want to see the difference, take that array or take that linked list or take the values, shuffle them, and then put them into the uh, collection you're going to benchmark, and that'll give you something more of a, you know, relatively reasonable picture of the world. Um, avoid random access if you can. We'll get back to that later. Um, but pick data structures that don't do that, if at all possible. Um, avoid using more memory than available, just buy more memory, right? It's not expensive. You can look at some performance counters to, get you, uh, to give you an idea. There's different tools on different OSs. Uh, what you're looking for is page faults. You're looking for cache misses uh, to see that stuff is not where you looked for it, and then you end up going to memory or to the last level cache and so on. Uh, and then, you know, there's a lot of costs associated if you can reduce these things all the better your performance will be great. Disable swap, because you can, right? Priming memory is something that is more of an advanced technique. So if you have memory mapped files, um, they're not actually in memory. What you can do is walk through them and bring them into the page cache, and then everything will be in memory, and life will be great. Um, you need to worry about though. Um, you, you need to worry about other processes pushing pages out of the page cache because the page cache is sort of the leftovers of memory are used for the page cache, or you can uh, force lock the pages into the page cache, which is even better. Um, if you do using uh, memory map files, that's something you can do. Right. Now we're going to start diving into the JVM and what it does with your code. And what we're looking at here is one line in my Java code that is putting some love into a hold. Uh, it's all these lines of assembly. Why is that? Uh, it's because of compressed loops and because of card marking. So let's have a look at, at these little lovely nuggets of JVM code or JVM behavior. So what's an OOP? An OOP is an ordinary object pointer. All objects in the, you know, your objects are OOPs, all the references are OOPs. Uh, some other things that are internal to the JVM are also OOPs, uh, but they're not real pointers in a sense. They're representations of pointers that might be moved by the, J, by the GC, so they're managed pointers. Um, and, hmm? Right, yes. And then when we use them, uh, we have to use memory barriers. Memory barrier is a really bad name, uh, but it's a term. I, it's not my responsibility. Uh, and memory management sort of theory. And, and you have a block of code that you execute before or after you get some memory or you put some memory somewhere. And you do that as sort of a, a hook for GC to happen or a hook for some accounting to happen on that uh, object pointer. And it's something that happens in managed runtimes, right? So it happens in the JVM. Um, and it turns into like hidden symbols in your code. So if it's like looking at a Word document editor with all the little niggly bits. So you want to read something from uh, P1 because you want to read some field in it, and then you go through the read barrier for that, you go through the read barrier for P2, and then you get the object, and you get this massive amount of code for what seemed like a reasonable one-liner in Java. Uh, and conversely, in C, it would be a one-liner. In other languages, it would be a, a very simple translation. In a managed runtime, this is different. So we're going to look at a read barrier for the uh, open JDK, which is compressed oops. Uh, Zing doesn't have compressed oops. We have just full-sized oops, but we have a different sort of load barrier we'll have a look at just now. So if you use compressed oops, why do you use it? It's default. It's in every JVM. We use it to get larger heaps without getting fat pointers. 
Uh, and at that point, our pointers are no longer pointers because uh, we compress them. How do we compress them? We understand that objects are aligned to eight uh, bytes because that's how we allocate them and we move them around and they stay aligned. Uh, so all the first few uh, bits of, of my address are going to be zero, so I can ignore them. I can just shift the address to the right and then I can just do this. I can compress the actual pointer by shifting it three places right in the case of eight byte alignment. Uh, and by that, I can increase my heap size to up to 32 gigabytes, where before I could only use four. So that's really great. The other sort of side effect of it is that uh, references are much smaller, so my objects are smaller, so more of them fit in the L1 and L2 cache, and this is really great to, for cache utilization. Um, but there's a price to pay, right? So what does compressing an OOP look like? Um, writing it in is, uh, this is what it looks like without compressed oops, sorry, I sort of lost track of myself. And this is what it looks like um, on the compressed oops side. The interesting thing is it's actually very efficient to do because um, there's an addressing mode in x86 that allows you to treat the object as uh, an array or to treat a uh, sort of adding up to references as an array, uh, what we lose is a register that is the, the sort of base of the heap. So there's a trade-off there, but writing uh, out the, uh, sorry, reading out the, um, so yeah, reading out the, the reference is quite cheap. Writing out is the three lines we saw on that previous slide. Um, and compressed oops are a read barrier because you have to decompress before you read through them. But on the plus side, you can copy them without decompression. So that's an optimization that happens a lot in the JVM. You can compare them without decompression, which is also great. Um, LVB is different. Uh, in LVB, we have concurrent relocation of objects. So we do a test, we check if the object has moved, and if it has moved, we're going to have to do some shit. Uh, we're going to have to uh, chase it and make sure we correct the reference and so on. That's the sort of code path. We're not going to go into that. Um, but there's a few interesting things that happen here. Um, for Zinc, for instance, I have, to I, I have to go through the read barrier before I copy objects, and I have to go through the read barrier uh, before I compare objects. So I pay a little extra. Uh, and the reason I pay a little extra is because I want to have concurrent relocation of objects. So, swings and roundabouts, you have to pay for the good bits. Uh, mostly, it doesn't happen. So, it's a, it's a fairly you know, infrequent event when these happen. You can read more about the C4, the concurrent GC uh, algorithm we use. Uh, there's a paper, it's all very sort of open um, and makes interesting reading. Right, moving on to card marking. Card marking is the right barrier, it's the other side. Why do we do card marking? Uh, it's a GC optimization. We don't have to do card marking. We can have a GC with no card marking. Uh, the problem would then be if uh, we wanted to find all the young objects, then uh, we would have to scan the whole heap. And that's not something we want to do because heaps are getting larger and larger and we want to optimize it somehow. And how do we optimize it? Um, we uh, have an old gen and a new gen because generational GCs are a good thing. So we don't want to scan the whole heap. We're just going to scan the young gen in the young gen collection and most things we'll get rid of then. Now the problem is how do I know if objects in the old gen are referring to objects in the young gen? Um, so that I know that I can't free them. Uh, so I only scan the new gen, but I have to know something about those references and their presence in the old gen. Uh, so card marking is a way to optimize it. I mark cards in the old gen as dirty, and I only scan those cards that are dirty when I scan uh, the old gen. Like everything good in life, this comes at a price. Uh, and the price is I have to mark the card for the parent object in the old gen. So. I, I look at the card table, I punch something in, and life is good. 
this is a, a right barrier. It's an optimization for young collections. We want to reduce the... Old gen tends to, to be significantly larger than young gen in, in most applications, so we want to optimize that. Uh, and it introduces a small overhead. It comes in different flavors, though. And that's uh, interesting for me because I look at a lot of assembly code because that's my job. Um, so this is uh, an illustration of the difference between what we want to do and what ends up getting done. So here's our little instruction. We put bar into foo, and then there's four instructions that are nothing to do with us. They're just uh, object-related accounting. This is what happens when we have um, card marking on. We use card marking um, because we want to avoid contention. So storing into the card map is not that uh, bad, but if you have different threads hitting that card table uh, concurrently, you can have false sharing on the card table. It's sort of a pathological case. It doesn't happen all the time. It happens in some benchmarks, and it does happen in some applications. Uh, and when that happens, we flip on the flag, and the assembly that gets generated is different. It's, we can see there's more instructions per write into an object. And then with G1, uh, there's even more. So that's that little instruction there. That's what we wanted. And all this extra code got generated. And the takeaway from that is that you know, what options you use on the command line will impact the way uh, your code is generated and the GC impacts it. And also, that objects are special. So takeaway is references mean extra work. <coughs> Impact can change. And the, the thing about normalized data structures is twofold. One is you don't pay for the uh, OOP accounting. You don't pay the write barrier. You don't pay the read barrier. And that's great. Uh, but the really great thing about normalizing your data structures is that you don't pay for the referencing. So you're no longer randomly walking through memory. So if, if, for instance, there's a user with an address, with a you know, street number, with a letter, or whatever, and I had to go you know, and chase those objects all the way to the end and then come all the way back and use that value, that's going to mean you know, four different loads just to get to that bit in the end. They're in no particular order. I'm accessing memory in a, you know, from the CPU's point of view in a completely random manner, and there's every chance I will hit cache misses along the way. So what should have been something very straightforward turns into a massive operation. Um, but if I was to take all these data structures and flatten them into the user, that would be really cheap, and I'll be where I want it. I think there's, there's a, a cultural sort of difference when people moved from C into Java, they had it in their heads that you know, structs are you know, nested in other structs, and that's quite nice. But in Java, you can't do that. There's no nesting. Uh, and also in Java, there's no mixed, uh, mixed inheritance. So you, you do composition rather than inheritance, which is great. You get a lot of itsy bitsy little objects with their own encapsulated behavior, but your chasing point is all over the show. So if this sort of pattern shows up in your uh, sort of hot spot in your application, you can do something about it. You can try and move data up the object hierarchy, and that can provide some really great performance boost to, to your application. Value types are one effort that uh, I think there's been a couple of talks about that in this conference already. Uh, the one effort to introduce sort of structs, sort of uh, big types into Java, and there's another effort, effort called uh, structured array or object layout, which is um, another tack on the on the same problem. And they're both trying to do the same thing, which is allow you to pack your data in a, a nice and neater way. There's also packed objects from uh, IBM, uh, but none of them are actually commercially out yet. So for now, just move your field up. So there's nothing we can do about it. OK, this is the, uh, the last part of the uh, presentation. Very contemplative. And um, the JVM must be, give us pause. Must it really give us pause? Yes. Um, every JVM 
on the planet pretty much has a stop the world pause. Why do we stop the world? We stop the world to clean up stuff, to, to rearrange stuff, uh, to have a GC phase or a deoptimization, or curiously to take a stack trace, or to unbias a lock, uh, or redefine classes, and all that sort of good stuff that we like about the JVM, a lot of it happens in stop the world pauses. And here's a question for you, can you stop other Java threads without calling whatever thread suspend or stop, which you shouldn't use because they're terrible methods. Uh, but can you stop other threads from a from your code, from your little thread? Can you stop all the other Java threads in an application? And I'm not going to ask because we'll move right along. Yes, you can. You can trigger to stop the world pause. You allocate an object, it might trigger a young GC. There's no way for you to know. There's no try allocate. But if I'm going to trigger a GC, just don't do it. Um, Zing suffers less because we have a concurrent GC on the, on the young jet. There are still stop the world pauses in, in Zing. It's not like a perfect world. But this one we don't have. We don't have the issue with the old gen exhausted, which is if you allocate a large object, it doesn't fit in the young. It has to be allocated in the old. It doesn't fit in the old. We have to clean up everything uh, sort of thing, right? You can hit a, a synchronized block. It used to be biased. Now you're hitting it from two threads. Everybody has to stop because those two threads are having an issue uh, with each other. You have to unbias the lock. Everybody waits, and then everybody sort of releases and curses those two threads muttering under the moustaches. Um, profile sampling is, uh, I think, under, under understood uh, issue here. Pretty much every profiler you use has uh, what's called the safe point bias, and we'll get into what safe points are. And that means, uh, but it, as a side effect of using the profiler, you're inflicting stop the world pauses on your JVM. They might be short, but your, everybody stops for you to take a picture. Um, <clears throat> and then you're hitting some cold code in the, your uh, application, you de-optimize everything, and yeah. Everybody waits for you to make up your mind. Right, talk a bit about Zing, because they pay me money. Uh, and actually, I'm, I just celebrated one year working for them. I love the guys. It's a great team to work with. I really enjoy it. It's not just that they pay me. Uh, I think it's a great product, but hey, it's, and they pay me. So um, maybe I'm just saying, right? We have a fully concurrent GC. Um, we have uh, ready now, which is trying to reduce the number of deopts uh, you experience in your application by remembering optimizations from run to run. Um, we have no bias locking. That's a good thing and a bad thing. That means you won't hit the, the stop the world on unbiasing. But if your application is really single threaded and you never hit the, that problem anyway, then yeah, Zing will actually uh, do the lock. Uh, we do have some stop the world pauses. And the way we look at it, if our stop the world pauses are smaller than OS noise, then we can spend our time somewhere else. So yes, we do stop the world, but it's, uh, the size of the pause is not uh, relative to the size of the heap. It's uh, very predictable pauses. So we're OK with that. Uh, some of them could be removed with some engineering effort, but it's, it's not very high on our priority list. OK, how do we stop the world? The JVM to stop the world sort of raises a flag and says, right, everybody stop. It's sort of, uh, I don't know if it's a game you play here with children. It's like you know, Wolfie, Wolfie, and you turn around, and everybody was walking up to you, and they all have to stand still. And um, it takes them time to, to stand still, obviously. And we'll get into that in a few slides. So what's a safe point? A safe point is the state of a thread. Uh, it's not something in your code. Being at a safe point is the state of your thread. Uh, so if you're waiting or idle or blocked or parked, you're in a safe point. If you're running Java code, you're not at a safe point because this is you're mutating the heap or because you're running some code or because you're basically running. We don't know what you're doing. Okay, You're between safe points. And then if you're... Notice it says running already, because if you're ready to run, then we, we'll, we'll, we'll just wait for you to get some CPU time. Uh, 
If you're running a native, this is a misconception people have about save point. If I have a native thread, I can't stop it. I can't get it to a save point. It's in some native library somewhere. It's out of my control. So I'm not going to stop it. Before we go into JNI, that's part of the cost of JNI. Before we go into JNI, we go into a save point, we put our house in order, and then the JNI code goes along, does its own thing. Uh, if the JNI code tries to climb back into Java, then we have to sort of check what's happening with save points and so on. But native threads can continue running while you're you know, stopping the world otherwise. Okay, so what does a save point pool look like in your code? Uh, in OpenGDK, it looks like this. It's just one instruction. It's a test on a page. That page is protected. Uh, and the implication here is that um, when you hit a save point where the flag is up, uh, that page is protected, you're going to experience a page fault. So actually triggering, triggering that is, is quite expensive because you have to go, the kernel has to notify you. It's a whole lot of shaking going on uh, when that happens. Uh, Zing, uh, and actually I think, uh, I was talking to some other JVM designer the other day, other JVMs do that as well. We uh, do the switch in user code. So we look for a uh, flag and then we uh, jump to the save point bit. Uh, important thing, important the difference between Zing and Hotspot there, Zing has uh, thread local save points. So I can do this to just one thread. In OpenJDK, everybody goes to the save point. There's just one save point flag. Um, which means to get stack trace for a particular thread in Zing, I can just make that thread go into a save point. In OpenJDK, if I want to take a picture of somebody in the audience, everybody has to sit still. <laughs> so, um, there we go. This is what happens. Um, where do we see save points? Uh, we see them in while loop uh, back edges. We see them in, in loops over logs, but not over ints. And we see them on method exit or entry, depending on the JVM you're on. So, they're not everywhere. We're not going to check what's happening all the time. Similarly to those children creeping up on each other, uh, they're not going to look. They have to actually move. So it's going to take time for us to find out what's happening, which raises an interesting question. How long was this GC pause? And it should be what it says on the tin, right? It should be whatever, 45 milliseconds. Right. But it's not. It's potentially a lot more than that. Uh, and the reason for that is time to save point. The color coding is all about the same color coding we, we used with the thread states. So we have some threads that are actually running. They're actually on a CPU. Uh, but they're running some code. And one of them notices the time to save the, the save point flag early. So I say, please stop. And one of them stops. And the other keeps going a little bit till it finds out it needs to stop. Then we have the yellow threads, which are, you know, they're contending on a CPU. So one of them comes in and one of them comes out. So we notice one of them is running when I ask them to stop. Uh, so it will actually stop sometime. And then the other guy will have to be swapped in and run a little bit and then come to a stop. So threads that are suspended in the run queue, they slow me down in getting to a save point because they have to go through a context switch and all that good stuff before we can hit the, uh, what I describe as hammer time, right? The red thread is suspended uh, and is completely oblivious to everything that's happening here. So it was suspended before, it stays suspended after, it has absolutely no impact on time to save point. Time to save point is not included in GC term, which is cheating a little bit. Uh, so you can add this option to your GC logging and see it in your log. Um, and the maximum actual pause is the time to save point plus the pause time. So it's not fair to say so that, that everybody paused for the time to save point plus uh, the pause time, because if they did, then the time to save point would be really short, right? They stopped in different stages, but the uh, JVM has been waiting for you to go into a GC pause in all probability for the length of the time to save point. Uh, 
what can cause a long time to save point that's important? Inlining removes the end of method uh, save point poems. Are we done? Was it okay. one minute? Okay, great. No questions. Right. Uh, long counted loops. Uh, this is a great way to shut down a JVM. You do a uh, for loop till max int. Maybe you nest another one of those goodies inside it and you add up something, right? There's no save point forever or for a very, very long time. And what will happen is at some point the JVM will say, stop the world, and this one thread won't stop. And he'll keep going. And all the other threads will sit there, and that bastard is just, you know, churning away. He's never going to stop, right? And your JVM will be effectively dead because you can't even connect the JMS console to it. You can't, nothing is moving. Everybody's holding their breath for this. Uh, so if you want to kill your JVM, or somebody else's, right? Shared runtimes and all that good stuff. Large memory copies, you need to worry about. Um, the unsafe copy memory is something you shouldn't do, uh, but if you do do that because you're you know, naughty or whatever, um, you should chunk up your copies. Uh, and if you look under the covers for like byte buffer put for direct buffers, that's exactly what happens. Uh, interrupted threads, like I said, people standing in the queue, they have to get some time on the actual CPU to let the stop happen. And page faults. Page faults are funny because um, you hit the page fault, you wait a long time for the you know, beer from the moon, and then only when you get it, everybody else can keep going. So where in the native world you suffered, uh, on the JVM, everybody suffers. Um, and there's a corollary there when you use direct buffers, memory mapped files, you're reading from a file. This is just, it's quite likely to happen. Uh, but to the JVM, it just looks like another move because it's memory mapped. Uh, so there's no safe point around that read. You hit a page for reading from disk, you know you're reading from disk, it's a memory mapped file. Everybody waits till the beer from the moon comes here uh, and sitting there. Uh, right, so use that flag, add it to your favorite flags list. Uh, time to save point can dominate the stop the world times. It happens, it's a real thing. Uh, look it up, some people really suffer from it. Some applications don't suffer from it. Enable the flag and find out, right? Um, beware the save point bias profilers. Again, because uh, while your thread is doing that hot loop, that hot loop will never show up in any profiler because it's not at a safe point. I can't see the stack there. Nothing is happening, even though we're all waiting for it to happen. Um, you can use other profilers. Java Mission Control that comes out with the JVM now is not uh, biased. ZVision, which comes with the Zing, is not biased. Uh, this Honest Profiler that uh, is sort of an open source effort, uh, that's not biased either. So it will actually sample the stack uh, and observe it not at the safe point. Um, chunk, chunk, chunk large memory copies. That's it. That was, uh, that's everything I had to say. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Nitsan. So it's, uh, it's lunchtime, and here's a lunch pro tip for you. Supposedly, they're serving lunch in, in, in a place called Bar 4, which should be 